Okay, good morning, everyone. Sorry to interrupt your conversations, but we we should get started uh, just to make sure that we have time to get through everything this morning. Um, before we get started, this is a question from a few Bible studies ago, and I don't I don't even remember exactly who asked it. Uh, but I ran across a note I wrote for myself, and I thought I would bring back an answer. Someone had asked whether uh, the name Palestine, as referring to uh, both the modern territory and just the territory as we think of it in uh, the Bible history, relates back to the word for Philistines. The short answer is yes, um, at least in what I found that uh, that word Palestine relates back to Hebrew and other words from that time that refer to that as the land of Philistines or um, land of the Phoenicians, which historians tend to think the Philistine people were related to those peoples who sailed in the Mediterranean and eventually settled uh, kind of on those southern coastal areas of that greater Palestine area, which again, that term still is around today. So like I said, I ran across that. I don't, I don't remember exactly who it was that asked. Was it you soon? Okay. I, I do have Sue's question here, but I didn't have it specifically next to that, so I didn't know if there was another question that I was missing. But um, yeah, the short answer is yes. At, at least in some way, it relates back to uh, that Philistine thing. So. All right, uh, then today we're going to talk about something uh, almost entirely different from that question. Uh, we're talking about the, the, the Bible, as in the book that we have and the books that are in it. We're talking about the canon of Scripture or the topic of canonicity, and we'll talk more about that. And this is really a leftover in some ways of our study last week about the intertestamental period. Because after going through the history, and after talking about some of the societal developments out of that time period, the last thing we had talked about is how uh, that, what that time period's effect was on religious writings and on scripture, and how things like the Apocrypha, a lot of those writings came out of that time period. And the last thing that we would have talked about, but we, we ran out of time, uh, would have been, well, just how is it that we have the writings that we do in the Bible, and we say these are God's word, and yet there's other writings that some of them even bear the title of being written by other biblical figures, and, and we, we don't read them in church. We don't say these are inspired. We don't say this is God's word. Uh, so that's really what today's study is all about. Um, let's pray. I'll say a few more things uh, in terms of just introducing what we'll go through. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go through the PowerPoint. A little bit different uh, style for today. So let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for gathering us together here uh, this morning to be encouraged and fed by your word. Uh, bless us as we study uh, about your word and about the, the trust that we have that it really does communicate to us uh, the truths that you reveal as we go through our study this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, when we talk about canon or canonicity, uh, we're talking about uh, a collection of things, a compendium, a gathering of, of these works that go together. I think maybe even today people are more familiar than they were with that term um, even as much as a decade ago because people like to talk about the canon of fictional works, like if people are fans of um, you know, comic books or the many movies these days that they make about comic books, they'll talk about whether that's canon or not. Like did, did this particular um, you know, filmmaker or somebody else insert something that wasn't originally there in the series? And so they say, is it canon or not? Um, or people like to pick up on little details and, and say like this character, even though it's not a part of their life or a facet of their life, that's ever expressed in the work of fiction. They're like, this little detail shows us that according to canon, he's a, you know, he, he takes care of plants or something like that, just because you get a little snippet. Uh, and so we're talking about like this, this whole collection that is the authorized official collection of things. Uh, and when it comes to scripture, we mean the books that really are the Bible. And as we go through our study this morning, we'll see no one ever really says, and it's, it's not really any one person or organization that tells us, well, this is why this is the canon. 
And that's kind of where we'll come back to at the end. But we're exploring these questions. Why these books? What makes them holy? And then that who makes them holy? Or, or you could even say who uh, is the authority uh, behind that? Uh, and as we go through this PowerPoint, it's not a PowerPoint that I made. It comes from one of our uh, seminary profs at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. Uh, so there are a few slides that we might skip just because they take us off in, uh, into material that um, is a little bit beyond what we want to look at today. Uh, there are some slides with Greek on them, but we'll, we'll try to make sense of those as we encounter them. Uh, but again, it, it, it was, I, I can't remember exactly where it came from, but I do think it was geared more for a seminary audience. But it still serves our purpose as well, and so I thought it would be a good overview. So what makes something canonical? Uh, well, we'd say if something is God-breathed, it is canonical, right? If, as the scriptures say, the scriptures are God-breathed, if there's words that are inspired, then they ought rightly to be included in the canon, the collection of inspired works. Kind of a, a, a no-brainer. Man has no part in that. And so already we're establishing, right? Well, it's not because one person, like say the Pope, or an apostle or somebody said these these are the books and so that's why we trust them to be God's word. Uh, therefore God and God alone determines uh, through the act of inspiration which, which books are canonical. And human beings can only gratefully receive what God has given. And in many ways, right, um, everything that we do in the church uh, everything that we are as Christians really comes back to the action and activity of God, right? Uh, we talk about our good works and we say, well, where do they come from? They're fruits of faith, the Holy Spirit working in us. It, it starts with God's saving work uh, that comes to us. And that's why we can say that this or that thing we do is actually a good work in its quality. Uh, same thing with the Bible, right? It comes from God. He's the one who, who inspired it. He's the one that's ensured that it has been preserved and it exists and it comes to us and it's through his words themselves that they show themselves uh, to be canon. Um, and so once again, we, we are just the grateful recipients. And there we've got a passage from John, chapter 10. Uh, my sheep know my voice um, and they listen to me uh, and I know them and they follow me. So again, just a, a verse relating back to that truth that um, we're just recipients of this thing. We don't, we don't determine it. Which means that the church does not give the book. Uh, and here again, we'd be speaking uh, probably most directly against what the Catholic Church would say. Right? Um, they say the, the Pope is the vicar of Christ. Vicar really means in place of someone. So right, Christ isn't here on earth anymore, so he left us the Pope, is what the Catholic Church would say to tell us what God wants. Uh, not true, not the case. Uh, the first quote there is from a man, uh, J.I. Packer. Um, he was a, a Calvinist theologian, so we don't like everything that he would say. Uh, in fact, probably not a lot of what he would say, but he did say this. The church no more gave us the New Testament canon than Sir Isaac Newton gave us the force of gravity. Point being, just because Newton you know, discovered that, hey, there's this thing called gravity. We can calculate its force, right? 9.82 meters per second, approximately. Um, doesn't mean he invented the thing, right? God, God created the world to have these forces. Um, same way that, well, you can identify this or that as being truly something that should be in the scripture. It doesn't mean you've made it um, or authorized it to be scripture. Uh, it simply means you've observed what exists. Uh, Martin Luther, somebody that we would uh, like to listen to a lot more on, on the things he said, said, The church cannot give more force or authority to a book than it has itself. A council cannot make that to be scripture, which in its own nature is not scripture. Uh, and so, again, you can think of his time. It's the Reformation, right? And he's, he's going against the big and powerful Catholic church where what they say is what goes and uh, what they say is what the people uh, assume is true and is necessary in terms of matters pertaining to salvation. And Luther says, well, that's not the case, right? Uh, you've got to let God speak. 
Keep going. So the New Testament canon. So we'll talk uh, a little bit specifically just about um, some things in the New Testament. Um, and in part, there, there's more to say about the New Testament as well, um, because the, the Jewish tradition um, you know, was so, so careful to keep the Old Testament, the Torah, that not that there's, I guess you would say, not um, issues with the preservation of, of those texts where some books and some forms have um, you know, more, more reliable manuscripts and, and things where there's just difficulties with translation uh, or that, again, we talked intertestamental period that there were writings coming out of these Jewish um, sects, you might say. Uh, and that, that things pertain to that. But as far as like books of Moses and the Psalms, Proverbs, etc., and even just most of the prophets, like those, those were established for a long time. This is scripture. And again, we're not trusting in them being scripture because the Jews said it for all that time, but that was established, that was what they had. And Jesus and the apostles referred to them as God's word. And that's what we'll see here in this section too, is that, well, we're talking about the Bible as a unit. And so, okay, if we're a little more sure about the Old Testament just because of its ancient tradition, um, well, how do the two come together as a unit? And we'll see that, again, it's self-authenticating, that Jesus and the apostles in the New Testament refer to these things, they're consistent, so on and so forth. And so that's the next two slides, is some examples out of the New Testament that unite the words of Scripture together, uh, both by means of reference, right, calling back to something else, and then... Um, you, you might say by means of the content as well, right? It's this consistent story of salvation. So first of all, we have Jesus' promises, right? He says, uh, John 14, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Uh, and the Greek below it is of that passage. That's not something else. Uh, but there we start off again, right? Jesus is saying this is... God's doing. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit uh, that teaches us all things. Uh, which doesn't mean that uh, we should expect whispers in our ear uh, that, that that's God going to be teaching us these things. Because we also have Hebrews 1 that says, in the past God sent his prophets. Um, in these later days he has given us his son. Uh, and so as we see another biblical truth, right? A lot of times... Uh, the acts of God, while they might be, you might say, predominantly described as being done by one or other of the persons of the Trinity, anything pertaining to how God saves us, uh, those, those acts are not divided. And it's God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all, all participating. Uh, and so while we might say rightfully, right, it's the Son who died on the cross, right? It wasn't the Father, it wasn't the Holy Spirit. Uh, but in terms of, well, how does God bring his saving truth to us? Uh, that is an act of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so uh, the, the Lutheran theologians like to say the, the uh, acts of God toward our salvation are not divided. Uh, they are not divided, but they are done by God, all three persons. Uh, so Jesus starts us off again with uh, the, the overarching truth when talking about the, the canon uh, of Scripture, the collection of what is God's word. Uh, we need the Holy Spirit. Uh, any questions so far? I know we've kind of just been running through a lot of content. Let's keep going then. Another passage. Very similar thing. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. So now we're progressing a little bit further into this matter of how can we trust in particular the New Testament scriptures. Uh, John 16, here's a chance I can ask you a question. Do you remember the setting for Jesus' words in John 16? I'm not positive. Was that when Jesus, before, um, before, um, he, 
it was his talk to the disciples, like before his, uh, no, before the passion and, and the crucifixion and so forth. Correct. So th this is part of really an extensive section where Jesus talks to the disciples, prays for the disciples, all before he's he's going to be handed over, um, and and arrested. It's it's from that that day that night, um, and in many ways it's his, you know, it's it, this is his last will and testament, right? They have the Lord's Supper. Uh, he teaches them about humility by washing their feet, and in John. He goes on and on and on explaining to them some of these things. So he, he talks about where he's going, right? Uh, in my father's house are many mansions. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I uh, would not have told you. Uh, and Thomas is the one who says, well, how do we know the way? We, and he says, uh, well, if you've seen me, you know the father, and you know where I'm going, and you know the way, all those things. Uh, and finally, it, he even gets to a point where he kind of just spells it out for them, and they say, ah, now you're speaking plainly. <laughs> Because uh, they weren't really getting it, and then he, he kind of spells it out, and, and they kind of get it, uh, at least to the point where they can feel like they s can say they get it. And then John 17 is, is more leading into when he prays for them, and so that's the long high priestly prayer. He prays first for the disciples, right? The work that they're going to do, they're going to be in the world, but not of it. I don't ask that you remove them from the world, um, but that you would protect them, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Uh, but in all of that, what is he doing? Well, he's, he's, in part, preparing his disciples for their apostolic ministry. And that's really what we have here. Uh, it is not just the fact that the Spirit is going to be encouraging them, feeding them through the Word, and feeding them through, um, maybe we'd see more of those immediate ways in the early church, but also then, they're going to be the authors of New Testament Scripture, right? Some of them. John, Peter, um, you know, Matthew's Gospel, things like that. Um, and so what is, what is Jesus saying? Well, these words that are going to come out of the apostles' teaching, they're the truth of God, revealed by God and inspired by God. And what did we say at the beginning of uh, our PowerPoint is the thing that makes something um, scriptural? Can I say, yeah, God breathed. Uh, and so here we're making that connection between Jesus, his disciples, and, and what's coming, you might say, in that apostolic age. And, and that will be uh, something we, we build on a little bit as we go forward, too. So, uh, fancy Greek-based word, autopistisia, uh, which means self-authenticating. Uh, defined, spelled out there uh, on the page for you. Uh, which is to say the word possesses this power in and of itself. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Uh, and Jesus in John 6.63, which is the bread of life discourse, at the very end of it, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Uh, so the word possesses this power of itself. In the, the Bible information class that I use in the lesson about the Bible, at the end of it, there's this section, it's called food, it says food for thought, right? You've gone through this lesson on what's in the Bible and uh, what to make of the Bible, just understanding it. At the end, it's something to think about. And it says, here's all these different, I guess you could say, um, apologetic arguments, right? Defenses of uh, the Bible as it stands, as something that is worth your time, and that reasons why you can believe it's really God's word. Um, and so it talks about things like the overwhelming manuscript evidence in comparison to similar ancient texts. Um, it talks about the unity of scripture, right? How the prophecies all line up. Uh, it talks about how um, you know, people in the New Testament talk about the Old Testament, things like that. And then the last one is, well, when you read through it, the Holy Spirit works, and you become convinced in your heart, right? The, the, the life-changing power of it. It's something that you can't be convinced of by a human speaker. Um, and so, right, faith in the Word really becomes a matter of faith as God works through it. So the self-authenticating kind of seems almost like a cop-out. You're like, well, you just have to believe that it is, right? Um, it's like a Santa's sleigh in the movie Elf, right? People have to believe in it for it to work, if you've ever seen that movie. Uh, it's not a cop-out, though. It's not just simply you believe in it and you make it 
into something because you believe that it's something. Uh, it's once again God being present in his word. Uh, and, and that really is in some ways a mystery uh, that goes beyond our comprehension. It's revealed to us, right? God says that the word is living and active. God calls Jesus the word incarnate. But there's still sort of some divine mystery behind all of that. How can this be? Uh, and yet, if we go back to what we started with, it's, it's God breathed. It is a thing of God presented to us. Uh, then, then we, you might say humbly, uh, approach it as a divine thing. Uh, much in the same way that any of the Old Testament prophets talked about one. They weren't really worthy to hold this word and to speak this word and to be preachers of it. Uh, but God makes them, makes us worthy, makes us capable. Uh, let's keep going on. So once again, the word possesses its own self-authenticating power, convincing people of its divine authority. No higher authority can be called on to attest to it, because as God points out, right, who's higher than him? Uh, and so the preached word was immediately accepted as testimony from God. Again, we're talking specifically here about New Testament stuff. Uh, they heard it and they received it in their hearts. Uh, they were encouraged by the teaching of the apostles. Uh, so things from Acts where, again, right, Jesus sends his apostles out and now they're teaching and people are receiving it uh, as God's word. And so it is that St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13, This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. And that last one he, he's kind of saying, right? Um, no one who's going to be claiming to teach God's word is going to disagree with what's in the content of this letter. Uh, and that is a, you know, that's something that comes up in some of Paul's letters, is that there were those who debated Paul's qualifications as an apostle. Not just Paul, but some of the others who worked with him. And there was that guide um, you hear about in Acts, right? The Bereans of noble character who searched the scripture. It's, is there agreement between these messages that claim themselves to be from God uh, because you know, start with something that's that's very familiar, very accepted, very clear, books of Moses right, you get these, this God who is gracious and compassionate with the promise of salvation and he basically says I'm going to save you again and again and again but he also does hold the hard line on what is good and what is right and what is wrong alright, well if you're going to deviate from that and all of a sudden flip those things on their head uh, you're disagreeing not just with some of the more well-established and accepted things, but you're disagreeing with Paul, right? He's not saying anything new. Uh, and so Paul, uh, again, kind of speaking as, uh, as a guide as to what believers should and should not accept as truly being from God. He, he basically saying, you know, you know what the rule is. Um, and if it's difficult, right? Uh, prayer certainly would be something as well. We're letting the Lord be interpreter, interpreter rather than jumping uh, to conclusions hastily and um, in, in an inappropriate sort of pride, proudful way. Uh, Paul's expectation. Again, so it was with the apostles' written word. Uh, there are places where the apostles referred to each other's words. Uh, maybe one of the more well-known ones is when Peter says that some of the things in Paul's writings are hard, uh, which, which is encouraging because like, it is hard. I don't always get it, <laughs> um, even after a few times. And it's like, even the apostles uh, acknowledge that some of these difficult things uh, are difficult. Uh, and again, it's revealing the truth of God to us. Uh, so Paul says in Colossians, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. And he says, I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all brothers in Thessalonians. And so uh, these, these New Testament books we have were letters. Uh, oftentimes they were sent not just to one particular church, uh, but to uh, a, a collection, a grouping of churches. Uh, and they were shared, and that, that's part of the reason as well why these 
I used to say, humanly speaking, why they were preserved is because they were spread around. Uh, again, apostles were on par with uh, God's work. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, Paul writes in Ephesians. There, now it's not just equating the apostles' words and works with uh, Christ and the church and God, but uh, with the Old Testament. Uh, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, putting them on the same same platform. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Uh, right, the unity of the Bible, Old Testament and New. Uh, they are put on the same level. Uh, and very often that's, that's something to be aware of in Scripture, right? What things are being mentioned in the same breath, breath as other things? You know, you talk about the persons of the Trinity and what evidence does the Bible give that, well, the Holy Spirit really is God. One of the passages that's, that's looked at is from Acts, the story of Ananias and uh, Sapphira, and uh, Peter says you've lied to not just men, but to God, and then in the same breath he brings up the Holy Spirit's name equating Holy Spirit to God, right? Same thing here. Uh, apostles, prophets, put in the same breath, being equated with one another as far as uh, authority and inspiration. And as we've been seeing, Paul's writings, these are scripture. Uh, there we go, we've got the, oops, I want one from there. We've got that passage from Peter that I referenced before. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes in the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. So, again, it uh, implies a few things. One, right, Paul's letters scriptures, as other scriptures. Uh, and then, if Paul, if Peter is talking about Paul's letters to the people he's writing to, then, then there's also the understanding that people have access to these scriptures. Uh, so they don't just have their Old Testament, but they're becoming acquainted with the apostles' writings, uh, as we are. And that kind of ends that section about the New Testament writings, uh, and how they uh, demonstrate themselves to be on par with Old Testament writings, as far as inspiration. Any questions or thoughts there before we go to the last section, or one of the last sections? When you said that about the Bereans, it reminded me of when Tom used to have to, when Pastor was gone and he would have to teach a Bible class, he always started with that verse from the, from the Bereans, about the Bereans, and saying, do you have a problem with anything that I I'm teaching, or if you see a conflict with God's word, let me know. I'll just start with that. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I mean, that's, that's a good thought, not just when a lay member leads a Bible class in place of the, the pastor, but right, for, for any pastor, even, even one that's been around. Um, you know, uh, on one hand, he might just say something accidentally that's wrong or misleading. Uh, Better, better to address it than to just leave it out there. Um, or there, there may be, you know, not with a, a harmful intent, but just a misunderstanding on his part where, you know, someone else can, can shed some light on, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, so it is always a good, a good reminder. And then certainly, you know, in our, our world where you can get online and hear anything you want, uh, th there's a huge caution uh, for those things. And, and it's something, you know, it's something that requires you to have a knowledge of Scripture, too. Right? How is a person going to walk into a church and say, I don't know if this is really what the Bible says, if they don't really know what the Bible says, right? Um, so you think of, think of people who, you know, we, we talk about, um, you know, you would hope that people would be in a church because what it teaches is good and sound. Uh, but in addition to just the fact that, well, that's very often not how people think because we're sinful, uh, very often there's, there's not the knowledge there either to be able to, to make such distinction. 
things. And right. so, you know, that's kind of this encouragement too. It's like be, be aware of, of what uh, scripture says. Be familiar with it. These are God's words. You know, that's, that's maybe something to remember as well, right? This, and that's something we always need reminding of too. Like if, if this is really what we believe, right? That there is a God and these are the things he says and does. Shouldn't we put a little bit more um, concern <laughs> into how we respond to it then? Uh, and of course, the reason we don't is because we're sinful. It's not that it's a cop out, but it's, it's a conviction. Uh, but that too puts us on the same level. Like we're all sinners. Uh, there's a reason why all of us will doubt things or have troubles with things or just maybe not put the time and effort into what is, right? We're not always Marys, a lot of times, or Marthas, right? That, that sort of thing. Um, it's because we're sinful. Uh, but again, it kind of comes back to the matter of, well, if, if there is a God and we believe in him and these are the things he says, uh, perhaps there's a good case to be made for, for being a little more serious about them. Uh, and again, God, God is the one who, in his mercy and grace, leads us to do so. Uh, you can think about Bible study, right? Very often the same people are here every week, and they're, you know, they're maybe not the ones that you think. They, they're the ones who really need this, right? But why, are they, why, why is this the group that's here in the first place? Well, because you've heard the word, right? And it's not just a habit. It's that the word is what brings you back. It's, it's God that's established. And so it's only by the grace of God that you could even look at, at a group of regular Bible study attenders and be thankful. Like, these are the people who, who maybe do know and, and get things a little bit more. But it's not because they're better Christians. It's because uh, right, they, they're in the Word. They keep getting brought back. Uh, so, so things that, again, keep us humble, but also things to, to give praise to God for, that they're demonstrations of His grace. Any other thoughts? I did just have... Yeah. I did, I did just have... Um, I went through some books that people donated for the preschool yesterday afternoon, and several of them were were religious books and they're for kids and so they all you know they all sound great and then when you read them you're like eh. it's, I mean some of them were fine but some of them it just couldn't I didn't feel right because there's just enough of things that aren't quite don't match up with the Bible and and you have to be aware of that and these are kids so yeah. I think a lot of times oh they're just free they're not going to really get the undertones or whatever but um, it's important enough that uh, one of you either throw away or donate because you just, it's just you don't feel right because it's not doctrinally sound. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, since you brought it up, one of the things that's probably most common in, in children's books, as far as religious material, that you're like, oh, this isn't too bad, but but actually, it's pretty bad. Is is the moralizing, where it's like the the moral of the story is rather than it's. God save it, right, or grace or anything, where basically the book is, well, you want to be good for Jesus, don't you? Um, okay, so be a good little boy or girl, uh, and that, that ends up being the message of the book. That's not the message of the Bible, right, uh, that we want to be good little boys and girls for Jesus so that he's happy with us and he likes us. Uh, it's not it at all. But, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I just thought I'd mention that since you, you mentioned the, the topic of books, uh, children's books. And on to a word about books. Uh, a big book is a lot, of, a lot of trouble. That's essentially what the Greek comes out to. Big book, big, big bad thing is what may be a little more literal. Uh, the Bible is a big book. Uh, there are a lot of books in it. There are a lot of words in it. Uh, and it spans in its composition spans a lot of years. That presents a lot of issues. First issue is, well, these things were written when we didn't have the publishing methods that we have today. There, there weren't computers, so you couldn't just type it up and have your proofreader grammar check thing and uh, editors and then print it. These were handwritten. Uh, and handwritten on, on uh, various materials. So consider the technology of the Bible. Uh, and, and so on one hand, we're going to think of like right, the possible challenges it presents to us in um, you know, 
know, the, the, I guess you could say the potential trust you have in something that's old and from this technology. But one of the things we'll demonstrate is that the limitations of the technology uh, require certain care and attention that then leads us to see, um, I guess you could say, some, some of the trust that is rightfully placed in this tradition, if that makes sense. It's maybe not the clearest way of expressing that. But, but the limitations of the technology lead to a certain care that preserves it. So, uh, when Jesus is in the synagogue in Nazareth, uh, it said he comes up to read. Uh, he's handed the scroll of Isaiah. Unrolling it, he found the place. Uh, now, I'm, I'm by no means a, an expert in, in things ancient texts, but you kind of get the idea, right? You, it's, it's hard to picture just what that was like and just kind of some of the, the implications of having a scroll of Isaiah, unrolling it, finding the place. First of all, uh, right, we say, look in this place in our Bibles today, and we've got a book. We know how books work. It's English, so we go left to right. Uh, we have, uh, if, if you're not, if you don't have your Bible uh, books memorized from confirmation days, you have the nice little index in the front. And then you've got chapters, and then you've got verses. You didn't have that with scrolls. Uh, so scrolls, because... Again, you can only write so much on a scroll before it gets to be an unwieldy length that you can't really hold and wrangle with it. Uh, probably had a book, a book like Isaiah, really long, a lot of words, would have, I mean, that would have been all that was on a scroll, if maybe even that wasn't broken up into a couple. Uh, sometimes with shorter books, like the Meyer Prophets, we talked to there, they call it the Book of the Twelve, because they all got compiled together. Uh, but you had, to, you had to open it up, you had to open to just the right part where it is, and you had to have a pretty good knowledge, if you're Jesus, of where this is, because you, you can't just look up a verse reference, because they didn't have chapter verse references back to that. Uh, average roll uh, uh, was about, I've got a note here, 35 feet in length, 10 inches in height, so pretty hefty thing. Enough to contain the 12 on one scroll, again, speaking of those minor prophets. Uh, or like an entire gospel. So, again, a pretty hefty thing. Um, a, a lot to deal with. Uh, the next slide shows us kind of an example, right? Where it was written. Uh, and here is a page that does have some, um, I guess it's got like uh, some extra paragraph markings on it. But, right, you're dealing with a, a big text, handwritten, uh, trying to find its, its place on the page. Uh, Part of the point being people who worked with these texts had a great familiarity with them. Uh, so when Jesus talks to the people in general, you know the scriptures, right? These were things taught and read to them, but especially those Pharisees, those scribes, um, those were learned people who, who dealt with these things. Um, on to the next. And so consider, what what it would take to have a library, uh, a collection of the scriptures, if you have to have these multiple scrolls. Uh, and in Jesus' day and, and, and times before that, right, in the development of the synagogue, which again is something coming out of that intertestamental period, uh, that, was, that was one of the things they had there. They had these scrolls of the scripture there. Um, so it really was a center for the word. And like we said, a development coming out of that intertestamental period. Uh, you can think even before that in the, the Old Testament period, uh, how easily some of these things were misplaced. That in Josiah's time, after years and years of wickedness and idolatry, like, oh, hey, look at this. Here's the, here's the law. Um, not like a, a little pocket New Testament was slid under a, a cabinet. And they're like, oh, here's, here's the book of the law. And now... Big scroll, but we just didn't really bother to look and, and see what was on it uh, because we were too busy sacrificing to idols. Uh, it would take some work and some care to have this. Uh, and I've got a, a little bit of a longer note here. So what does this mean? When people today talk about the Old Testament in Hebrew or the Greek translation of the Old Testament, they're talking about something that did not exist for the ancients as anything but a collection or a library of scrolls. That's not to say that they failed to put the scrolls into various subgroupings, like uh, the Hebrew Old Testament. You get the Law, the Prophets, and 
the writings uh, or follow a certain order in their groupings, we know that they did uh, because those traditions are handed down. However, there evidently was some shifting of some books from one group to another. A book like Ruth, for example, is found on some lists to be attached to the book of Judges within the subset known as the Prophets. On other lists, we find it included as one of the writings. Now, our lists are much more standardized, uh, and that's in part because you can't do that. You can't pull pages out of your Bible and shove them into the other section. It just doesn't work very well. Uh, and so our groupings, uh, as soon as Bibles started being printed in the similar manner to what they have been since the printing press comes around, you get a much more consistent, standardized method. Uh, but this also helps us understand how easy it would be for some religious communities to include certain books in their catalog of scriptures, which other communities do not. Uh, and here we're kind of getting into things, again, pertaining to the Apocrypha. If you've got all these religious writings, among them Old Testament books, but then you've got a scroll of Enoch, well, where are you going to put that in your life? Are you going to put it with the rest of the old religious writings? Right? You're not going to put it there with whatever you know, other kinds of writings you might have. Uh, and so these groups would have them together, and that's where, again, you kind of get the, maybe not confusion isn't the right word, but, but different things mixed together, because it's not a book that you publish, and you put your name on it, and you say, this is our publication of the Bible. Uh, and so sometimes even in these libraries, there are non-religious things, uh, like lit or, or you might say further removed things, like liturgical texts commentaries, uh, rules and regulations for the community. Uh, and this is what was found, uh, for example, with the Dead Sea Scrolls. We had all these different scrolls, uh, and in them, again, things pertaining to community life, and rules and laws, and religious sort of things, and then Old Testament scripture, as we're familiar with it. Um, so all these things, right, they're, they're compiled together in libraries more so than books. Uh, because they didn't have books. But as you go forward in time, uh, you do start to get things more like books. So you move on from scrolls to codex, or codices, um, which kind of uh, early books um, still would have had to be handwritten, uh, but you start to see that the codex was popular among Christians. Um, they were among the first adopters of the technology. Uh, and it's a little bit more manual to deal with. You can kind of have everything together. Uh, a little bit easier if you yourself want to put notes directly in there. You got extra margins on the sides to, to write things in there or to write in between the lines, uh, things like that. Uh, and so in the early church, probably more like second, third century, there's a lot of um, codices, codex collections. Uh, we see in the New Testament as well that uh, the apostles, particularly Paul as an example, uh, were familiar with having personal collections. In 2 Timothy, Paul says, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with the carpus at uh, Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Uh, so there he's, he's very likely talking about both kind of things, scrolls, um, the parchments is probably more of a, a, a codex thing, perhaps. Um, do not put out the Spirit's fire, do not treat prophecies with contempt, test everything, hold on to the good. Um, there, with the implication, maybe hold on isn't just you know, sort of metaphorical, hold on, keep it, but literally hold on to some writings that are the good ones. Uh, we do ask you not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. So there too, the apostles acknowledging the fact that there would be writings out there claiming to be things which they were not, which is very common of, um, again, I kind of say second or third century writings that slap the name of an apostle on them and uh, try to sell things because uh, the market for written materials becoming more of a, a true marketplace around that time. Uh, and Paul writes at the end of 2 Thessalonians, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. So even Paul putting in the sort of authentication, uh, I write to you here uh, in a way that would be recognizable to people familiar with Paul. 
What, what was Paul's letters written on? Um, I don't know that we could say with, with certainty. Um, a lot of times those scrolls were some kind of animal hide. Scroll. Um, and so I, I, would, I would think probably it was written on a scroll of some sort. What, what type of material, um, I don't know. But I, I would think probably a scroll more so than he's putting it in a book, a codex form, something like that. Uh, and certainly it would have been too long for it to just be as we think of a you know a sheet of paper or something like that, she sheets of paper. So uh, prob probably a scroll, I think, would be a, a safe assumption. I guess I can't say absolutely what what the thoughts are behind that, but uh, just based off of all you know what we've been going through scrolls, and and most likely, and again, that's something that that passage speaks to as well, is that uh, he's probably dictating this to a scribe, you know, someone someone who's helping him. Um, an associate, and, and even those people get mentioned um, in some of the books. And, uh, um, the names are escaping me now, but then he writes in the end, kind of puts his signature on it, you might say. Um, but that was very often a case. Like That was a job that people had and were trained in, to be people who wrote or who copied. Um, and that was a job, too, where like somebody would sit up here at a podium and have a text, and then all of you are at your writing stations, and I read to you what's there, and you write it down, and that's how you publish a written material. Because um, you don't have printing presses, you don't, um, you know, copy machines, you know, anything like that. Um, and so what's the fastest way? Um, having someone read it, and you write it, which, leads to errors. Sometimes they did copy, right? So you got it up here and then you're writing down here and well that leads to errors too. Uh, and that's where sometimes in like biblical texts uh, you get things where like is this, I think this is more common with Old Testament ones. Like you get to the end of a sentence and sometimes like a, a wrong word is there or a word is doubled or something because well where do you mess up? Like, so as you're going from here to there and you double things like that. Um, but yeah, someone like like Paul, or even like um, the Gospel of Mark, for example, the, the theory is often stated that Mark, probably being a close associate with Paul, excuse me, with Peter, learned of these things from Peter, who was an eyewitness, and Mark wasn't there, unless you assume that Mark is the unnamed figure who runs away naked when they arrest Jesus. Uh, and so he's kind of in the way that Luke researches. Mark is researching from Peter, and there's some internal evidence of why it would be Peter who does it, and then maybe even someone else is the one who actually wrote it, right? But it's attributed to Mark as being the author because he's the author, even though it might not have been his hand to pen to, to material. Um, so I guess it, it, that's a long answer of, of saying, hard to say with certainty, but this is kind of the way these things were done. Um, there's, there's much more that could be said, but probably not by me. <laughs> Anne? Um, wasn't it like back then, even into more modern time, like the 1600s, most people couldn't even read and write anyway. So the people that could even do that, I mean, how can you say they're not God chosen because there weren't that many of them? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I don't want to say more than I should about that. I think um, literacy kind of ebbs and flows through times and societies. Uh, certainly there's a big difference between scribes who are readers and writers and just, you know, the person who has a vineyard or the person who has, um, you know, olive trees and they tend to that like the shepherds the herders right they're they're different I, I think just from some of the circumstantial evidence of scripture um, some of those people around that time are maybe a little bit more literate than we would give them credit for because you know there, there are written like transactional receipts like 
be able to find a stone, and it's like, here's the receipt. Again, you're dealing still with a, a, a higher class, you might say, a person than, again, shepherd, herder sort of thing, where they're merchants and have to deal with that. Uh, but definitely, you know, the, the, the people uh, that are writing uh, are, it's not like today where just anybody could write something, you know, or with the advancements of computers, you can you know, tell chat GPT, write me something that sounds like this, and it just spits it out uh, based off of other people's works. Um, there's definitely something to that, right? And, you know, some of Jesus' disciples just fishermen, so was part of the, the writing through a scribe not just the way it was done, but part of a necessity? Well, uh, I, I think two things, right? The Holy Spirit is inspiring these words. The marks of the original authors are in them as, as right, the, the characteristics and traits of a, a, a given writer. Uh, so, yeah, back to your main point of, like, it shows, you know, God's hand at work through these things. I think you say absolutely. Um, but that's, that's part of what's remarkable, too, is, like, these, a lot of these men aren't the scribes, right? Paul was one of those guys who was trained, and, um, but a lot of the others, you know, Peter, John, they weren't. Uh, let's, let's quickly go through some of these last things here. Uh, just a matter on collections. So, uh, this slide is talking about the fact that there were collections of New Testament scripture very early on, uh, before the end of the first century even, uh, because people refer to the Apostle, right, letters of Paul, they talk about the Gospels. Uh, the Didache is a, like, late first century, maybe early second century, if I recall, um, sort of an instructional, you might think of it as a catechism, like a very early catechism, and it references these things. Uh, and, and the point being that there is a, um, a developing collection even very early on of New Testament texts. Uh, we'll skip this page. So we kind of come back to our original question. That if, if we've spent so much time basically saying you can't determine a canon by any methods, why, why even talk about it? Uh, and, and part of the reason is because there are these writings which are uh, not genuine, pseudo uh, pigrapha, false writings, uh, apocalypses, other gospels. Um, some of them are mere romance, kind of a fiction, fiction kind of thing, just using apostolic names. Others are Gnostic. We're not going to get too deep into that, but Gnosticism was this um, spiritual teaching coming out of that first century. Uh, you start to see some anti-Gnostic things in the writings of John, like First John. Second John, uh, some of that were basically the Gnostics spiritualized things a little bit, uh, downplayed like physical resurrection and things like that. Not to get into it too much, but um, so you got kind of two genres. So some of them just took these names because they know if they wrote this, people would be interested. Some of them genuinely were false spiritual teachings. Uh, the church never debated whether or not to include Gnostic writings. The debate was only over Christian writings. Uh, and that's something uh, that we should get on. Oops. I'm going to go to the next slide and we'll come back to that. You've got these terms, again, fancy terms, homologumina and antilegumina. So universally accepted things, uh, so the Gospels, Paul's letters, 1 John, Peter, scriptures, which there's never any great debate or discussion about as to whether they're genuinely scripture. Uh, but then you've got ones where some were, we're not quite so sure. Um, Hebrews, well, there's no author identifies it. There's less marks there. James talks a lot about works. Even Martin Luther in the 1500s was like, I'm not so sure about James. Um, and you can read his commentary on it. Uh, and some of those, with Luther too, you can sometimes see the difference uh, at, over time as he studies more, he's, he's a little bit more convinced that this really is scripture. Um, but you get them into these categories of some are just never debated, they're accepted right away, and they always have been according to the, the tradition, some um, a little bit later. And I'll go back to the other slide, kind of touch on periods of development. So during the time of the apostolic apostles, right, these things are implicit, they're clear, they're plain. 
uh, kind of like Paul was talking, you're receiving them, you're, you're seeing them. Uh, the next period, uh, increasing clarity, right? They're, they're starting to get compiled a little bit more. Some of the, the big names like Augustine, um, Chrysostom, I don't know, uh, old ancient names that you might, might run across or encounter but probably aren't that familiar with. And then people start to put lists, and in their commentaries, they always are including a consistent list of things. Uh, and then you get this period of criticism uh, into the later church, and that's getting into the times where all of a sudden um, there's some major controversies. I think 325 is about the time that the Council of Nicaea meets, and that's when they're, uh, you're, you're getting the Apostles' Creed coming out of that time period, right? We got to confess what's right because people are starting to say some things about the person of Christ that's not right. And okay, now we need to add some more because they're questioning the Holy Spirit. We need to write a new creed because we're have, having problems with that. Uh, and then around 350 is where you, you, you kind of get a thing that now is held on to uh, from then until now. Uh, but the early church never decreed. They never came out and said, this is it, this is not it. It's, it's more based on the evidence of, again, what were these church fathers using when they wrote commentaries? What were they using when they had to read scriptures? Uh, what were, were their collections? What were their Bibles as they're starting to have them in more un, um, unified forms? Uh, what were they consisting of? Um, and so, yeah. Back to that thing. Uh, and then back to some things we briefly touched on. Apocrypha, Old Testament books that were found in the Septuagint, that Old Testament translation to Greek, but not in. MT stands for Masoretic Text. Again, we're running out of time, but uh, that, that's the Hebrew texts that we have. They're not, again, they're not autographs. They're not original. They're not the things that Moses wrote on. They're not the things that Isaiah wrote on, but they're, they're copies of that from a later time. Uh, Catholics call these Deuter Duro canonicals, which is to say a second canon. Um, so it's not the canon, but it's the second canon. We're, we're going to accept it. Uh, and they call the pseudepigraphica, epigrapha, uh, uh, apocrypha. Um, and so they're kind of, right, where we would say these are two categories that we won't accept. They kind of bump it up. And like one's kind of acceptable, the other uh, would not be. Uh, this is just false, and very often pretending to be writing. And these writings, typically come out of a later time, not so much that intertestamental time, but um, more like after 100 AD, after the time of the apostles. And this is where we'll end, uh, because again, we're over time. But this wraps things up. Lutheran tests of canonicity. Is it apostolic? Uh, is it written by an apostle or someone closely associated with an apostle? That's a good start, right? Uh, if there's a lot of evidence that it really is Paul, or that it really is someone like Mark, uh, that's a good start. Uh, what urges Christ upon us? Which is to say, is it Christocentric, right? There's the content. Um, is it teaching salvation by grace with a focus on Christ? Or is it moralizing? Is it just a story? Is it maybe way out in right field? Uh, and is it in agreement with the rest of scriptures, right? Again, the Bereans, comparing it with other things. Law, gospel, justification by grace through faith. Uh, and that's, that's where it comes down to. Uh, and maybe it's just one last thing to say. Uh, a study of the book of the Bible um, ought to inspire confidence in us rather than dredge up doubts in a place where all of a sudden you didn't know there were reasons to doubt things. Um, tradition is not the reason for our faith, but there is value in tradition, right? That, that's something as well. Uh, but again, right, you, you read the scriptures and working through it, the Holy Spirit, through the content of it, you might say mixture of, of uh, intellect as God has created humans to have intellect and divine as God promises to work through scriptures, uh, convince us of these truths. Uh, and that's where we'll have to stop because we took a lot more time than I thought we would. If there are any questions, we did start late too, but we always start late. Um, if there's any questions, uh, we guess we'll have to bring them back next time. Uh, next week, my plan is to start a study of 1 Corinthians. Uh, no particular rhyme or reason for that, but it's a good book to study. So uh, if you, if you want to read ahead, that's where we'll be next week. First Let's close the prayer.
Dear Lord God, we thank you that in your wisdom and power you have preserved your word over the centuries for us, uh, and that you still work through your word uh, to give us the, the comfort of your saving truth. Uh, and continue to bless us this morning as we uh, also continue to hear more uh, about your word, but especially from your word as you sp speak directly to us uh, the saving truths about your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. 